Uh, and we go for the second lecture from Ashville, please. Okay, so um, I guess I have the bad fortune of having to follow up on Nima's talk, um, but you know, hopefully I'll try to keep you engaged, maybe not as energetically as he did, um, but um, let me just remind you to begin with um, what uh, we learned last time and uh, where we are planning to go today. Um, so we were you know, trying to figure out how best to describe this microscopic model. Um, it's a model that has a Z2 symmetry, um, and we saw that there were two phases. Uh, there was a disordered phase, symmetry was respected, um, and an ordered phase where it's spontaneously broken. Um, and we also saw that there is a dual description of this theory. You can either talk about um, these particles, which are essentially the spin flips. So I said, let's go to the basis of sigma x, which is what you want to maximize when you're at large g. Um, and then as you lower g, uh, you begin to introduce some of the oppositely directed spins. Um, so let's actually, it's convenient to call these two basis states, which point along the x direction. Uh, let me call this one zero. So that's like the vacuum at very large g, we have no particles as it were. Um, and then the oppositely directed state, when the spin flips over, uh, it pays some energy cost uh, for this g term, uh, but then it's gonna pick up some energy gain from the second term. Okay, so as you lower g, those events become more and more likely, and eventually those particles, they move around, uh, these ones that, that live in a sea of zeros, uh, they move around and they, they condense and they end up giving you uh, the ordered state. Okay, so, um, uh, what I want to do actually after the class uh, yesterday, there were a few questions that were, I thought, very good questions um, where, uh, you know, this uh, mechanism was uh, kind of, uh, uh, you know, there, there were more questions about this mechanism. Uh, so today, before I actually get into the meat of the, uh, uh, the lecture today, uh, I want to give you a simple intuition uh, for this process of condensation. Okay, so uh, we'll begin with that. Um, but that's sort of completing some unfinished business of the last class. Uh, but really what I want to do today is to uh, sort of show you a different duality. We already saw this duality between two bosonic descriptions. Uh, this was a particle domain wall uh, duality. Uh, I'll show you a different duality from, from bosonic fields to, to fermions, and uh, that'll allow us to describe this critical point, the transition point, uh, very simply. Um, and I'll also talk about thinking about this as a model of intrinsic fermions, what's really changing for the fermions when they go from the left to the right. Okay, and uh, there we'll get a, a lesson in locality, why locality is really critical when you, know, when you look at these uh, kind of models and interpret their physics. Okay, so that's the plan for today. Uh, at the end of it, I want to derive some lessons from the one-dimensional case. Uh, the lessons will be very carefully constructed so that we'll be able to generalize all of this to higher dimensions. Okay, so there's a little bit of uh, hindsight involved over there, uh, but I'd like to distill all that we learned into some lessons that we're gonna apply next time to the two plus one dimensional situation. Okay, so, um, uh, so let me just uh, begin by giving you a little more intuition as to how this uh, symmetry breaking proceeds. Uh, I, if I imagine beginning at very large g uh, and lowering the coupling constant. Okay, so, um, so the way in which you get a broken symmetry state uh, in this language, okay, a very simple model of it, uh, is the following. Uh, at every site, uh, you can imagine that there is a single uh, state uh, that is repeated. Um, okay, so I have a product over all sites. Okay, and if I'm in the limit of G very large, uh, I have just the zero state. Uh, but imagine that I spontaneously develop uh, you know, some, some amount of the one state on every side. Okay? Uh, and I'm gonna suggestively label this amplitude phi. Uh, we're gonna see it's very close to the phi field we had uh, in this um, you know, phi to the fourth theory that we wrote down last time. Okay, and let me try to normalize this. Um, Okay, so um, the question is, uh, within this simple approximation, 
Of course, the real physical states are a lot more complicated than this. Uh, if you think about the state, it has no entanglement between the different sites. Okay, it's simply a product state over all the sites independently. Um, it has no entanglement. It's a very simple uh, class of states. Uh, but I can think of this as a variational state. Okay, I'm going to test um, you know, how good these variational states are. And I have a parameter of phi, which I can vary to find the best state. Okay, so, um, uh, so let's try to do that. Let's phrase this as a variational problem. Um, I'm going to try to minimize my Hamiltonian. Um, take this uh, energy. Okay, and ask what's the best phi I can choose within this very restricted uh, set of states. Okay, and um, the point at which you actually develop a finite, expect a finite value of phi uh, is where the symmetry breaks. Okay, so if you were to evaluate uh, what is the Okay, so this is essentially, if I think about small phi, okay, so this is really the order parameter. The sigma z operator mixes the zero and the one, uh, so it picks up an expectation value of phi. Okay, so as soon as I develop uh, non-zero phi in this, in this uh, set of states, uh, it means that I've broken the symmetry. You spontaneously choose a sign for this phi, either positive or negative, that tells you whether your spin is pointing up or down. Okay, so let's try to evaluate what the energetics of this uh, system is. Um, so if I look at the average uh, the energy of the Hamiltonian, there are two terms. Okay, so the first term uh, is this product, uh, sigma z, sigma z product. Uh, and within the simple ansatz, there's no co uh, correlation between the different sites. It just looks like a, a, a product of the uh, terms on a single site. Uh, I'm going to do the expansion for small phi, um, and in the, the lecture notes, I have it for a more general case, but uh, let's just do this here. So, of course, the, there's an advantage to having some non-zero phi because it gives you some interaction between the neighboring spins. Okay, that's why you want to eventually develop some of this phi. Okay, but there's a, uh, there's a cost. Uh, the cost is that... Uh, the expectation value of your uh, sigma x operator uh, is going to go down. Okay, you're putting in these uh, high excited states. Uh, you're inserting them into your ground state. Uh, there's going to be an, uh, an energy cost for that. Uh, and this is going to go as uh, there's some number over here. I'm not going to try to uh, calculate that in this, uh, at this point, uh, but there's some number. Uh, one half or something like that. Uh, and uh, there's a reduction uh, of the overall sigma x uh, field. Okay, and then there are higher order terms in phi. Uh, of course, only the even powers of phi uh, appear over there. So there's something of order phi to the four and so on. So it's good to keep track of all of them, but uh, for my purposes, it's, uh, this is sufficient. Uh, so what you find is that you have some term which is um, Okay, so uh, if I were to plot this function, uh, what it looks like is, uh, okay, so if I'm at a very large value of g, okay, this uh, coefficient is positive. Uh, if I look at the energy as a function of phi, okay, it's of course quadratic at, low f at small values of phi. It looks like that. Uh, the best that you can do is, um, is to sit at the bottom of this potential uh, and your phi is zero. Okay, so for large g, for an extended range of g, until you get to the point where this ga is equal to one, uh, it actually does not pay uh, to give you, to get some expectation value for this one. Okay, and, um, but on the other hand, if I start reducing this value of g, uh, there's a point at which, um, okay, so g star in this approximation, which is one over a, uh, where this thing uh, turns quartic, uh, you can calculate the quartic term and you'll see it's positive. Um, so it looks like that. And eventually, if you go below this value of phi, below this value of g, you get some potential that looks like this. Okay, so this is for g less than 1 over a. 
Uh, and the minimum configuration is no longer at zero, rather it's at one of these points, uh, plus or minus phi naught, let's say. Okay, the precise value is determined by um, you know, calculating also this higher order terms. Um, okay, and it's at this point within this approximation that you get spontaneous breaking of symmetry. Okay, so that's um, uh, you know, not a very uh, accurate approximation if you actually figure out what point this is. It's not at j equal to one. Um, it kind of overestimates the ordered state. Uh, but nevertheless, it gives you the right qualitative picture uh, that there is a transition where you get uh, spontaneous symmetry break. Okay, so just to make contact with what uh, Nima said in his talk, uh, he mentioned tensors. Um, so it turns out that there's a way to make this approximation more and more accurate. Uh, so we said we had a variational state uh, that looked like this, where, where the coefficients of these two were just numbers, right? Um, and the problem with that um, kind of approximation is that there are no, there's no entanglement between the different sides of your chain. Okay, these are literally different states that you just plug in on the different sides. Okay, so you can do better. Um, Okay, so right now what we did was we wrote on every site we had this, uh, where u and v were, were numbers. Uh, so instead, um, let me think about these as now uh, matrices. Okay, and this, um, Uh, I think about generating a state, I take the product over all the sites, okay, and, and I generate a state, uh, a variational state if you like, uh, by taking these products, I'll get, for example, for the term that is uh, simply the product of zeros, I'll have all of these u's, a string of u's present. Uh, I think of multiplying the u's as matrices, uh, and then I finally take the trace. Okay, so this is sort of a matrix generalization of the simple uh, mean field variational state, uh, and uh, you can work out some simple examples and see that this does give you quantum entanglement. Okay, so this is really how people try to simulate uh, these models. Um, they write on a variational state for the ground state, uh, and you make these matrices bigger and bigger, and you get a better and better approximation uh, to the ground state of your system. Okay, so, um, so this is sort of a systematic way, at least in one dimension, it's believed to work extremely well, uh, especially when there's an energy gap. So as long as you stay away from uh, this critical point, uh, you can get a very good approximation of the ground state uh, by writing down these type of variational states. Ah. So the, the first non-trivial generalization is to take two by two matrices. Okay, but in general, the U's and V's are gonna be some So some chi by chi matrices. Okay, and uh, the bigger this chi is, the better the approximation to the exact ground state. Okay, so chi is one is just this simple mean field theory. Uh, if you use two by two matrices and then you optimize, you take the energy and you optimize these two matrices, uh, you get the first correction to mean field theory. Uh, and then you keep, keep going, make these larger and larger, and there are theorems that tell you how big you need to go. Uh, to get a very close approximation of the ground state. Yeah, and in fact, you don't have to go very large. So it's a good exercise to just start with two by two matrices and see that this gives you, you know, some state that has quantum entanglement. Okay, that's actually what I do in the notes. Uh, you know, for example, pick U as sigma X and V as sigma Y, and you'll see the state has got some non-zero quantum entanglement. Yeah, so that's a nice exercise. Uh, you just take two sides. A Q is sigma X, B is sigma Y. These are just some other Pauli matrices, not, not related to the spins. Um, and you can show that this gives you the, um, just a EPR. Okay, so if you follow this prescription for a pair of sites with those U and V matrices, you get a correlated state. 
Okay, so that's sort of an aside. Um, before we talk about our, um, you know, the main, main topic, which is to go towards uh, writing down this Bose-Fermi duality. Any questions about this basic phase diagram? Okay, so, <clears throat> okay, so now let's introduce these fermions. Okay, and um, again, the details you can find in the notes, um, but the idea is that you can introduce these fermions that live on the sites uh, by taking products okay, of this uh, spin flip operator. Uh, this creates, uh, goes from a zero state to a one state and vice versa, and taking the product with a domain wall creation operator. Okay, so physically this um, uh, this fermion operator is, uh, it flips a spin and it attaches a domain wall. Okay, so um, you can also write down another operator that uh, flips the spin but in a different fashion, which is using the sigma y. Okay, and you can verify that these are actually uh, Majorana fermion operators. Uh, these are real fermions. Okay, so for example, they are their own complex conjugate. Okay, so that's a reality condition. Um, and they also satisfy that the square is unity. Okay, it's simply products of poly matrices. Uh, the squares are just unity. Uh, but they anti-commute uh, with one another. Uh, so if you take chi on a site, chi bar on the same site, that's the easy one. Okay, they anti-commute. They also anti-commute on different sites. Sorry? Ah, tilde, yeah, sorry. So I'm trying to avoid bar because it looks like it's some sort of complex conjugate. It's not, it's just a different fermion. Right. Okay, so these are uh, Majorana fermions. You can construct a complex fermion from them. If you wish, you can construct C dagger on every site, which is just chi plus I times chi tilde. Okay, and the number of these complex fermions, uh, you know, if you go back and see what it means, uh, the state zero is no fermion. Uh, the state one is one fermion. Okay, so on the single site level, there's a sort of a direct mapping to just the zero and one basis states. Uh, but when you look at this on, uh, on a chain with many sites, um, there's an additional factor, phase factor that comes in, uh, the string, uh, which is going to uh, make this fermion operator different from just the operator that looks at one side and you know, goes between these two. Okay, so there's a bosonic operator that only changes one side, only cares about one side, goes between zero and one. Uh, that's this operator sigma z. Uh, the fermion operator also does that, but it's sensitive to all the occupation numbers on the different sides. Okay, so uh, that's what gives you all the weird properties of fermions. Uh, they're really not local operators when you think about the fact that they anti-commute rather than commute on different sites. Okay, so those are the fermions. It's good to verify all of these uh, anti-commutation relations. Um, physically, it'll tell you why binding a charge uh, to a defect, that's really the domain wall, why this combination uh, is a fermion. And we'll see that that carries over to higher dimensions. Um, in two dimensions, we're gonna look at defects that are vortices. We're gonna bind a charge to the vortex and you'll see that that's a fermion as well. Okay, and same thing happens in three dimensions as well. Uh, if you have monopoles, you bind charge, you get fermions. Okay, so that's a very general kind of um, uh, you know, outcome um, and it's kind of good to see it in the simple context. Okay, so the whole point of, of uh, introducing these fermions uh, is to go back and rewrite the Hamiltonian uh, in terms of the fermions and 
uh, you'll see that something pretty amazing happens. Uh, we'll get an extremely simple looking Hamiltonian that we can solve exactly. Okay, so. <clears throat> Okay, so the first thing we need to do is to rewrite all the operators. Um, so let's look at the first, uh, the second operator over here, sigma x. Okay, so what is this um, in terms of fermions? Um, okay, so sigma x requires me to take the product uh, of these two operators, the z and the y component, the product will give me sigma x, uh, and these things will, uh, will cancel out. Um, so let me get the sign right. So. Okay, so that's the sigma x operator. Uh, the sigma z operator, the product that I'm interested in, which will go into the Hamiltonian. Okay, so this is uh, going to involve the two sides, um, and this is just chi i, i tilde, i plus one. Okay, so again, that's a simple exercise. Um, <clears throat> you get the chi tilde uh, because you uh, it's, it's good. You're going to get a little bit of the string now. Uh, you're looking at two different sides, so you get a bit of the string. Uh, it changes one of the sigma z's into a sigma y, ends up giving you one of these chi tildes. Okay, so those are the two terms that are going to appear. Uh, and the interesting thing is that both of them uh, are actually quadratic uh, in the fermion operators. Okay, so these are just canonical fermions, and my Hamiltonian is just a quadratic function uh, of these fermions. Okay, in other words, you can solve it. Um, it's exactly solvable, uh, and we'll see what this uh, the solution turns out to be. Okay, yes. okay, so let me take H. Um, <clears throat> I think I have minus signs for both of these. Okay, so. Sorry? What's little j? Little j is this. <laughs> j plus one, yes. Okay, so let's write this out pictorially. Um, so as a picture, uh, I have on every side, I have a pair of fermions. Um, okay, so let me draw them like this. I have a chi tilde on site J, let's say, and a chi. And this is the next site over, chi tilde, J plus one, chi. Okay, and uh, the two terms are doing two different things. Uh, the term with the G in it is simply pairing uh, these Majorana fermions on a single site. Okay, so this is the G term. Okay, there's some directionality that's assumed when I, when I write this term. Uh, you go from chi tilde J to chi J. Okay, that's why I've drawn the chi tilde first. And then I have the other term. Let me draw it as a double, double line. So that's like the J term. Okay, this is the ZZ term. Okay, that actually couples the different sides together. Okay, so that's what this um, uh, Hamiltonian looks like. Okay, so we know that the g equal to one uh, is the critical point. Okay, so let's go and look at what this Hamiltonian looks like. Okay, when I set j equal to one, well, then both of these uh, couplings are exactly the same. It makes no distinction of pairing fermions within a site or pairing them between the sites. Okay, so we also saw that g equal to one corresponds to the self-dual point. Uh, and actually self-duality in terms of these fermions is extremely simple. Uh, it simply means that you group these fermions in different ways. 
Okay, so this was one grouping of fermions within the sites. Uh, but if you wish, you could do an unphysical grouping, uh, which is to take uh, the pair like that. Okay, and if I rewrite my theory in terms of those pairs, uh, that's actually the dual theory. Okay, so the, everything looks really simple in terms of these fermions. Um, and in particular, this, the critical point at g equal to 1, let me call that hc. It looks just like that. Okay, so now you can sort of exploit the fact that everything is invariant. Uh, it kind of makes sense to not label things by the sites anymore. Uh, but let me introduce these new fermions. Okay, so this is chi tilde i. Okay, so I have uh, uh, these eaters that are uh, on this lattice with twice as many indices um, because I'm going to take chi tilde and chi and you know, put them into correspondence with these eaters. Uh, and at the critical point, I get a very simple Hamiltonian. Uh, it's just I sum over all these indices. Let me call them, uh, <clears throat> let me call it R, R. Okay, so, um, uh, so I have the sum, it's now a double sum, it's on twice as many uh, sites, but it's simply a product of these eaters. Okay, so we're gonna use this, uh, it, it, right now it's a, a lattice model, uh, we're gonna uh, focus on low energy physics, and we're gonna derive a field theory uh, that describes this transition. Okay, so we're gonna assume uh, that these fields are slowly varying, uh, we're talking about low energies, um, and uh, we're going to just retain the parts of the fields that are going to give me low energy uh, excitations. Okay, so if you go ahead and solve this, you can actually solve this completely. Um, it, it turns out the dispersion is, you can you know, solve it by using Fourier transform. Uh, the dispersion is the sign of the momentum. Okay, so the momentum runs between zero and pi. Uh, it turns out the sign of that is the energy. Uh, so the low energy modes are near zero zero wave vector, which is essentially const nearly constant fields, or wave vector pi, uh, where the fields oscillate, uh, they change sign uh, from side to side. Okay, so, um, so let me just uh, you know, uh, make the following ansatz. Uh, you can see, we'll see in a minute that it actually corresponds to the right low energy fields. Um, okay, so I have a field that varies slowly in space. Uh, when I use this notation, uh, it's varying slowly. And there's another one that actually varies rapidly, but I take out the rapid variation. Okay, so this is also slow. Uh, and this accounts for the fact that there are fields which change sign from side to side, but they are also low energy fields. Okay, so I can pull out that dependence, minus one to the r. It changes sign whether r is, uh, post, is even or odd integer, uh, times this uh, slowly varying field. Okay, so the field theory will be developed in terms of these slowly varying fields, eta one and eta two. Okay, so you can kind of see, you can anticipate where the two component structure of your uh, Dirac theory is gonna come from. Okay, it's really these two fields. Okay, so now let's write out the Hamiltonian. Um, okay, write out this product, so it's eta r, So um, let me say this r happens to be an even uh, integer, just to make things clear. Um, it doesn't really matter, you can keep that factor of minus one to the r. Actually, let me keep it. Okay, but there's an additional minus sign over here because you're looking at it at r plus one, okay? So now you make the product, uh, and then you sum over all the uh, values of r. Uh, of course, there are four terms. Um, there is the, the direct terms. Okay, so let's write out the direct terms first. Um,
Okay, so that's the direct term. Uh, there's a relative minus sign again because this is a rapidly varying field, a chain sign between R and R plus one. And then you have the cross terms. Okay, there's an eta one times eta two, both of which are slowly varying uh, and their product is multiplying something that's rapidly varying. Okay, so when you do the sum on R, uh, there's no Fourier component in this product that can cancel minus one to the R. Okay, that really oscillates on the, on the scale of a lattice. So all the cross terms will vanish when you do the sum. Okay, so that's really just saying that there are two slowly varying fields and they're at such different momenta that they don't mix. Okay, so that's the uh, result after doing the sum. You only have these two terms, you do not have the cross term. Okay, we'll see later when the cross term comes, um, but at this point I just have this term. Okay, so we said that these are slowly varying fields, so I can make a Taylor expansion. If I have eta one at r plus one, I can approximate this as eta one at r plus a derivative. Okay, and uh, if you want this to be a length scale, this derivative should be the half the, essentially the lattice spacing. Um, but there's a derivative that tells you how much this field changed. Okay, so let's use that. Uh, the square of this eta one square is just one. Uh, that'll cancel out the other one. Um, so at the end of the day, this, uh, the, the Hamiltonian at the critical point uh, takes on a very familiar form. Uh, <coughs> Okay, so eventually this uh, J will become some velocity, um, call it VF. Uh, I'll pass to a integral rather than a sum. I can do that because the are slowly varying fields. I put in a, a length scale that'll give me a velocity rather than an energy scale. Um, and this eta one, Okay, so I can make this look even more familiar by writing down a two component field. Okay, and then this over here looks like it a transpose sigma z. So these are now fields. Um, okay, so this really just looks like uh, the Dirac equation, actually this is, um, these are Majorana fermions. You have a real uh, doublet um, and there's some Pauli matrix which is like the velocity matrix of your, um, <clears throat> of your Dirac theory. Uh, if you were to trade this eta transpose for an eta bar, uh, this would become a gamma matrix. Okay, so you can go through all those manipulations. I won't do that, uh, but essentially this is, uh, has the spectrum uh, of a, a, a non-chiral Majorana Fermion, so the energy as a function of momentum uh, looks like that. Okay, there's a right mover, uh, d by dr, which sets the, you know, if the momentum is positive, you get positive energy, uh, and there's a left mover, which does the opposite. Okay, so there are a pair of branches, so this is um, on chiral uh, Majorana fermion. Okay, and the very important fact is that it's massless, Okay, there's no, uh, no mass term over here. Everything moves at the speed of light, which happens to be some velocity v uh, in our theory. Okay, so the theory of this critical point uh, in terms of the Majorana fermions is very simple. Uh, it's just a gapless, uh, a massless Majorana fermion. Um, and, uh, okay, so let me just draw that over here. Okay, it just looks like that. Okay, so, um, so there are two descriptions we now have for this theory. One is the fight of the fourth theory with the quadratic term switched off in terms of the boson strongly interacting, or I just have a free theory in terms of the Majorana fermions. Okay, so, uh, so the next step, of course, is to ask what happens uh, if I move away uh, from exactly the critical point? Okay, if I move away from this point, g equal to one, um, how does this change? And that will allow me to read off critical exponents. Um, the exponent, for example, that's controlled 
uh, by changing this uh, coefficient g. Okay, so example, how does the, if I move away from this point, I get a finite length scale. Um, the correlation functions are not completely long ranged. Um, they have some exponential decay set by a length scale. And one of the critical exponents is how that length scale is set by the deviation uh, from this g equal to one point. Okay, so we'd like to figure out the anomalous dimensions or the dimensions of various operators uh, of this, at this critical point. Okay, so, uh, <clears throat> uh, so let's see what the, let's try to write down the field theoretic description uh, of the term that moves me away from this g equal to one point uh, if I were to reinsert the g over here. Okay, so what happens uh, when I have the g uh, back in there? Okay, let's imagine this g is very small, a small deviation from unity, uh, and what happens then is that these two bonds are no longer equal. Okay, so this bond is slightly different from this one because g is not exactly one. Okay, so the additional term Okay, so you can uh, sort of guess it. It's something that depends on g minus one. Okay, of course, it's got to vanish uh, when g is exactly one. Uh, and it oscillates. Um, okay, it's uh, either above or below the average value, depending on whether you look at this bond uh, or this one. Okay, so it's gonna oscillate from, uh, from the new sides, from side to side. Uh, and it's going to give me this sort of term. Okay, and we can write down what this means in the field theory language. Uh, we go back to our operators, eta one and eta two, the slow fields, um, and I put them in, and then I do the sum, and I see which term survives. Right? Okay, and of course, the one that now survives is just the cross term. That's the only one that can sort of cancel off this overall factor. Uh, so this essentially becomes to some signs, um, if I go back to my continuum language, it becomes this term, the, the product uh, of, the, of my pair of slow fields. Okay, but this is really just the mass term uh, for my, my run of fermions. Okay, so you can write it, um, so the term eta one, eta two, you can write it in terms of this two component notation as uh, eta bar eta, where this eta bar is eta transpose times sigma one. Okay, so you're going to augment this, uh, the first term in your Hamiltonian by another term, which is the mass eta bar times eta. And the mass is actually proportional uh, to the deviation from j equal to one. Of course, your j equal to one is zero, uh, but you also know exactly how the mass depends on the difference between uh, j equal to, you know, between one and the value of g that you have. So over here you have some gap spectrum. Okay, so this uh, spectrum looks like p squared plus m squared. And over here as well you have a gap spectrum uh, with the opposite sign of the mass. Okay, but if you just look at the energy spectrum, you don't know the sign. Uh, it's simply gapped uh, and the mass, at least for small values of, uh, of, of uh, deviation is proportional to G minus one. Yeah, question. Um, so when you say, okay, let me repeat the questions and I, I have to understand this question. So you say, at the critical point, there's a chirality. So what do you mean by that? Yeah, so the, um, you know, so we can, uh, you know, directly go back and see what, uh, what exactly these fields correspond to. Uh, so I think I erased it, but uh, the fermion fields themselves are simply the product of the spin operator uh, and the domain walls. So there is some combination, um, and I'll sort of describe this in a little more detail in a minute. Um, there's a certain sense in which these fermion operators are actually ideal operators to describe uh, this phase diagram. Okay, and uh, so we'll do that in a minute. We'll kind of try to unpack uh, what this fermion operator means in terms of this phase diagram. Okay, so we'll, we'll 
you know, give, I think you're asking for a physical picture of what these fermionic excitations are, and we'll see that in a minute. Any other questions? Okay, so this actually, the fact that you understand what the mass term does as you deviate from the critical coupling already gives you one of the critical exponents. Okay, it gives you the exponent nu, uh, what's usually called nu, and it tells you this nu is equal to one. Okay, so it's sort of trivial to read off the exponents in this, uh, at least some of the exponents are trivial to read off uh, in this free theory, uh, which would be very hard to do within this bosonic description. Okay, so, um, <clears throat> Okay, so one of the questions is, um, how do I understand uh, these fermion excitations, how they correspond to things that are more readily visualized, uh, either in terms of spin flips or in terms of the domain walls? Okay, so what are these fermions? Okay, so we said this chi, for example, is sigma z times the domain wall creation operator mu z. Okay, so let's just look at this operator and some limits. For example, um, let me look at it on this part of the phase diagram where I'm deep inside the ordered phase. Okay, so deep in the ordered phase, okay, so we said that the sigma z uh, is some number Okay, there's some expectation value to the sigma z operator. Uh, so when I look at this uh, fermion operator, it's a product of these two, but essentially the first one is just a number. Right? I can replace it by its expectation value, and what happens is that the fermion begins to look more and more like simply a domain wall operator. Okay, so on this side of the phase diagram, um, you can erase this. Chi just looks like a domain wall, and in the disordered phase, okay, we said that there's this duality. Um, you know, so the on the one hand, sigma z was ordering over here, and on this side, you could think of it in a sense like the domain walls were condensing. Okay, so there are very few domain walls over here. All the spins are either up or down. As I increase this g, I start getting domain walls. Eventually, they condense. Okay, so there's an exactly dual picture. Um, so in the disordered phase, I essentially, uh, my fermion operator kind of dissolves into just the sigma z, into just the spin flips. Okay, so this operator has been designed such that in the two extreme limits, either on this side or on that side, uh, it matches up with the operator that produces the excitations. Okay, so for example, if I had this vacuum, if I wanted to create a single Z2 spin flip, I'd operate with the sigma Z operator. And that's exactly what the fermion does in the limit that you approach deep into this disordered phase. Okay, and similarly on this side, um, the fermion becomes just the domain wall, which is the, the simple excitation in your phase. Okay, now of course, at the critical point, things are complicated because neither of these two is a good description. Yeah, it's only the bound state of them that ends up being, continues uh, to be a good description. Um, you know, some string operator that creates a domain wall attached uh, to a spin flip. Okay, so uh, that I guess is the best I can do in terms of giving you some intuition uh, for what ends up being this, these excitations. Good, yeah, that's a very good question. So let's examine um, I was going to do this a little later, but let me, let's examine it right now. Uh, what, is, what corresponds to the symmetry uh, that we started with? What does it mean uh, in terms of the fermions? Okay, and um, you know, this is going to help us when we think about uh, what the fermion phases are. Okay, so the symmetry, okay, in terms of the spins, uh, we said there's a generator which is this product of sigma x. Okay, so what this is doing is it's going down the chain and it's counting how many of these, uh, so if I have some state of zeros and ones, uh, it's essentially counting uh, the number of uh, ones 
Okay, let me call that number of ones, but it's just the parity of this. Okay, that's what this operator in words does, right? It just, uh, every time there's a one, it gives you a minus sign, uh, and that product will give you the, the value of the symmetry generator. Okay, so, um, uh, so if you see what that means in terms of fermions, we said that every time there's a one, that's like having a fermion. Okay, so this G is nothing but the fermion parity. Okay, so the symmetry generator corresponds to the fermion parity. Okay, so that's a little bit strange because we think of fermion parity as always being a good symmetry of any fermionic system. But how do you break fermion parity? Uh, you can imagine breaking the symmetry G, uh, for example, by adding a magnetic field uh, along the Z direction. Okay, but what this is saying is that if you do that and you map that system back to fermions, the fermion parity is no longer going to be conserved. Okay, so let's try to do that. Let's try to break Okay, so there's a term uh, which is, for example, just sigma z on every site. <clears throat> okay, now we have broken the z2 symmetry. Uh, if I conjugate with g, uh, this term changes sign. Okay, so what does this correspond to in terms of the fermions? Well, that's going to be an extremely non-local object. Uh, but for example, the term which is sigma z at the last site, uh, let me call it n, Okay, this corresponds to simply the Majorana fermion chi of the site n. Okay, and other terms, for example, um, you know, sigma z at the, the first site will be chi um, <clears throat> at the first site and then product of minus one to the nj, where j is on all the sites greater than one all the way up to n. Okay, so each of these is going to give me something with a single fermion sitting there times some, something that's measuring parity of fermions for some other set of signs. Okay, but this is a particularly simple one. There's no string attached because it's at the very last site. It tells you once you break the Z2 symmetry, you're allowed to add for just single fermion operators to your theory. Okay, so that would be a disaster if these were real, if this was a model with real fermions. Okay, if this was a model with real electrons, we are certainly not allowed to add a term in the Hamiltonian, which is just a single fermion term. And the reason you're not allowed to do that, one way to think about it, is that fermions, uh, the fermion operator is not a local operator. Okay, it doesn't commute on different sites, the fermion operator does not commute. And we are told that um, uh, a field theory or a you know, Hamiltonian of a physical system has to be local. Right? It should only involve local operators. Uh, and you seem to be violating that when you simply add a single fermion operator. Okay, and the resolution, of course, is that these fermions are not the physical degrees of freedom of our system. Okay, we started with spins, and the demand is that the physical degrees of freedom obey locality. Okay, and what we wrote down is a perfectly local Hamiltonian, both those terms and the one we added are perfectly local in terms of the spin degrees of freedom, or the bosons. Okay, the derived fields, these chi's, uh, which we used as an, uh, you know, as an aid to solve the problem uh, are not physical degrees of freedom. Okay, and therefore, we have no reason to demand that the Hamiltonian is local in terms of that. Okay, so uh, this locality, um, okay, for these fermions, but it's okay since they're not physical degrees of freedom. Okay, it's only when you uh, go back to the spins uh, that you have this very strict demand that the local operators uh, of which your theory is constructed also appear in a local fashion uh, in your Hamilton. Okay, so this is important um, because if you're really talking about electrons, there's just no way to break the symmetry. If you're talking about the, the uh, state of electrons um, <clears throat> in, in a model like this, where the fermion fields themselves are physical, let me ignore the fact that the electrons are coupled to a gauge field. Um, just think of them as uh, fermions that do not have this uh, gauge coupling. Um, then your, if, you, if those are your local degrees of freedom, those are the physical degrees of freedom, uh, this fermion parity should always be conserved.
Yeah. Um, I don't. I don't know any connection here to supersymmetry. Oh, sorry. So the question is, uh, G looks like a written index. So is there any connection to supersymmetry? Okay. So um, I mean, the more simple interpretation of G is that it's just the fermion parity that coincides with written index and supersymmetric theory. Uh, but here it's just the fermion parity. So it's a basic uh, kind of ingredient in characterizing any fermionic system, even if you don't have supersymmetry. Um, and for you know, physical fermions, this is always uh, conserved, right? because you're not allowed to add just the fermion operator in your Hamiltonian. So you can label all your sectors by uh, you know, the values of the fermion parity, and you're guaranteed that they're not going to mix by any physical term. Okay, but of course, here these fermions are really derived quantities, and you know, all hell can break loose if you sort of break loose that, the original Z2 symmetry. Okay, and it becomes much less useful, once you break the zeta symmetry, it becomes much less useful to utilize this fermion language. And, and charges, essentially, yeah, that's right. Uh, that's a good question. So, um, so we're gonna try to, um, you know, describe this, uh, this similar kind of critical point in, say, two plus one dimensions. Uh, it turns out that there, the defect, if you want it to be a particle, you need to have a U1 symmetry. So if you just have a Z2 symmetry, the defects are domain walls, so then the defects are lines. Uh, it's not that convenient to work with lines. Uh, let's think of a, a symmetry where the defects are points. So a U1 symmetry will have vortices. You can attach the charge to the vortex, so you can describe this critical point in terms of fermions. So now you have two descriptions. Okay, you have one description in terms of phi to the fourth theory. Phi is now a complex scalar. And then you have another description in terms of Dirac fermions, uh, which are these composite objects, uh, which are massless. The thing that's different in two plus one dimension is that's not a free theory. That theory is actually coupled to a chern simons gauge field. Uh, so it's an it's a interacting theory. So on both sides, you have interacting theories. You have a phi to the fourth theory and you have, you know, uh, fermions coupled to a gauge field. And so now it's you know, a question of taste, which is you know, your preferred variables. Here we have a clear choice because these were really free. So there, there's, that's the beauty of 1D that you know, everything becomes simple and uh, it's just this. Another question? Or... Okay, so, um, so another point that I can mention uh, since uh, it came up is what happens to this theory when I add, um, you know, add this uh, particular term, uh, add this magnetic field along the z direction. Okay, so one very interesting thing that happens is that if I look at domain walls, um, you know, we said before that it, domain walls, the only cost of the domain wall was uh, where you reverse the spin. Okay, so if I had a pair of domain walls, uh, the energy cost of this configuration doesn't depend on how far apart these are. The energy cost is just you know, a penalty here and a penalty there. Okay, but now, if I apply a, a magnetic field along the z direction, uh, it definitely prefers all the spins to be up rather than down. Okay, so this pair of domain walls will have an energy cost that depends on their separation. Okay, so if I have a field, a uh, field along the z direction, the energy cost of this pair of domain walls will be the field times the separation, let me call it delta R, between these domain walls. Okay, so there's a potential connecting the pair of domain walls which increases linearly with separation. So that should remind you of quark confinement. Uh, these domain walls are no longer free particles. In fact, they get bound up. Okay, so people who do experiments on these kind of materials, uh, they can work in the limit where there's no magnetic field they can see that there are these domain wall excitations that move around. You put on a weak magnetic field, they're still kind of free, but once they kind of go beyond a certain distance, uh, they realize that they have the string uh, you know, connecting them and they kind of bounce back. Okay, and then you get the se sequence of bound states, um, you know, very much like the re you know, meson resonances, and they can see that in neutron scattering where they can excite these sort of uh, resonances. Okay, and there's a very interesting prediction that if you apply a magnetic field right at the critical point, a very weak magnetic field, 
these bound states, this sort of sequence of excitations, uh, they form a representation of a very large group uh, called the E8 group. Okay, so there's a, a lot of beautiful mathematical physics, even in this very simple model, once you turn on a magnetic field along the z-axis. Okay, now of course, all of that physics cannot be exposed uh, using free fermions. Okay, because the minute you turn on the z, z-axis magnetic field, you have to deal with terms like this sitting in your Hamiltonian. Okay, extremely non-local terms that involve uh, operators on you know, pretty much all the sites in your system. Uh, so it's no longer a tractable theory as soon as you lose the, the fermion parity symmetry. Okay, so that's why all these weird and interesting things can happen, uh, but you can still analyze them because it's very close uh, to a conformal field theory, uh, and these are perturbations of that conformal field theory. Okay, so, um, uh, so just to go to my last point, uh, which is really what is the distinction between these uh, fermion phases uh, which are on either side of, these, of this critical point. Okay, so if I just look at it, it looks like uh, they're gapped on, on either side. There's some mass term to my, my run of fermion. Uh, but we said that it's unlikely that we get a phase transition without something changing in the phase itself. Okay, so something must have changed. Uh, what is the character that changed across this transition? Um, and we'll see that that is really a topological distinction uh, between these two phases. Shall I? Actually, how much time do I have? I kind of lost track of the time. Two minutes, that's all I need. Yeah. Okay, so the distinction between these two sides, uh, you know, we can ask what does it mean in terms of this uh, diagram that we wrote. Um, if, the, if you're in the G greater than uh, unity limit, it's kind of con continuously connected to this picture where you have these bonds that are connecting the pairs of Majoranas. They combine into a, into a pair of states um, that simply get a gap. Okay, so uh, the G greater than one is simply a gap state. Uh, and we'll call it a trivial state because it essentially just involves the physics on single sites. We're really not communicating between the different sites, so there's nothing very physical that can happen, nothing many body-ish that can happen in that limit. Okay, but on the other hand, if I go to the opposite limit where I switch off G and I only have this term, it kind of looks the same. You know, you pair, off, pair up my run of fermions, you know, this pairs with the next one, except uh, you see that this one is left unpaired. Yeah, at the ends of this chain, um, you know, there's another one out here, okay, where the, the Majorana fermion has no neighbor to pair with. Okay, so this is chi L, chi N, let's say, and this is chi 1, chi tilde 1. Okay, so uh, G less than 1, okay, it all looks gapped in the bulk. Okay, but there are some zero modes at the ends. Uh, there's a single Majorana zero mode at either end. Uh, there's a Hamiltonian which you know, couples all of them except for the first and last Majorana mode, chi tilde one and chi n. Uh, there's no coupling between them. Actually, in fact, there is a very tiny coupling uh, that arises from some exponential uh, you know, sort of uh, uh, coupling between them, something that's exponentially small in the length of this chain. Okay, because there's an energy gap in the bulk. Uh, there's a little bit of tunneling. You can get to the other side and come back. Uh, there is some coupling, but this will go to zero uh, as a function of the number of sites in your system, uh, which is exponentially decaying uh, in the length of the system. Okay, so apart from that, if I just set that equal to zero, uh, every eigenstate of my Hamiltonian will have a two-fold degeneracy. Okay, it really doesn't care what I do with this pair of my Rana fermions. Uh, I can put the pair, you can think of this as a complex fermion that can either be zero or one, and the energy couldn't care less which you pick, whether you pick zero or one. Okay, so this is, uh, if you like, a topological degeneracy. If you actually had electrons, uh, you made an electron chain with this particular Hamiltonian, uh, then you would find that if you had an open chain uh, with some boundaries, uh, there's a two-fold degeneracy uh, of my um, chain of electrons. Okay, so there's a, OK, 
Okay, and you can ask where this degeneracy lives. Uh, is there a mode that I can point to where the degeneracy lives? Well, the degeneracy lives on either side of this chain. Okay, it's equally split uh, between the left and the right end. So each one of these should be sort of having a square root of two degeneracy in order to make up this complete degeneracy. Okay, so it's as though you have Hilbert spaces, local Hilbert space, um, Okay, because this degeneracy, the minimum degeneracy that you can imagine is actually split uh, between the opposite ends of the chain. Okay, so people think this is a very good way of storing quantum information. Uh, if you put this, um, uh, you know, put this in a state of either zero or one, the environment cannot really read this uh, state of your system. Okay, if it wants to read the uh, state of the system, it has to apply some operation on this end and then currently apply it at this end as well and then read out this information. Um, so this is a protected uh, qubit. Okay, so it's protected against certain kinds of errors. Okay, these fermions are really just electrons. Okay, so it's important that they're not these toy fermions which rely on the zeta conservation, uh, but really electrons for which the fermion parity is a good symmetry. Yeah, so people have actually constructed this in the lab after sort of much effort. Uh, we now have these chains, these superconducting chains, uh, which are, seen, which are you know, have been observed to have this twofold uh, degeneracy. Okay, so anyway, so maybe that's a good place to stop and take any further questions. <clears throat>